Hello everyone, so today we'll be looking at obedience, social, psychological factors and as always I'll be following along with the AQA psychology textbook for A-level, year one and AS with the green haired girl on. So the things you need to know and be able to recognise, I've included the specification point here, so this states that explanations for obedience, agentic state and legitimacy of authority. The definitions of agentic state and legitimacy of authority, you need to know these, these have come up previously. You also need to know that the term social psychological factors relates to both agentic state and legitimacy of authority. If that came up in a question, it would be looking for both of those. And also you need to know that these are explanations for obedience and that also authoritarian personality is an explanation for obedience. So if these came up, you would have to be looking at both spreads. And that's sometimes things that students don't recognise. They think, oh, a question can only relate to one of the spreads in that green textbook. But actually, it might be sometimes that there's a crossover. And the exam boards have seemed to want to do that more so in previous years. So what is agentic state and legitimacy of authority? Agentic state is a mental state where we feel no personal responsibility for our actions as we believe we are acting for an authority figure, i.e. as their agent. Think of yourself as an agent. Agentic state, it's got the word agent in, that's how I would remember that. And what that does is it's freeing us from our consciences, allowing us to obey a destructive authority figure. And we've got legitimacy of authority, and that's an explanation for obedience that suggests we are more likely to obey someone who we perceive to have authority over us. And this is justified, so it's legitimate, by an individual's position within a social hierarchy. So we have a bit more now on agentic state, and this is your AO1 marks. So we find that Milgram had an interest in Eichmann's death in 1961. Now Eichmann was a leader of a Nazi death camp and his excuse for killing Jews was that he was obeying orders. Now if we look at the next point that says destructive authority occurs because a person does not take responsibility. So what we can argue here is that Eichmann was an agent for an authority figure and so therefore he was in this agentic state. Now the opposite to being in an agentic state is being in an autonomous state and what we mean by that is where you behave according to your own principles and you feel a sense of responsibility towards your actions. So we have this idea of an agentic shift and that's where you shift from autonomy to agency and Milgram argues that we do this when we perceive someone else as having more authority than ourselves but why is it that we remain in this agentic state? And the answer to that is something called binding factors. And what these are, are layers of excuse to ignore what you're doing. So that reduces uh, the moral strain. So that feeling of, oh, I shouldn't be doing it. Because we use these things called strategies as well, where we shift the responsibility of the victim or we deny the damage that we're doing to the victims. So I've just gone on to evaluation here because the textbook jumps and then I'll go on to legitimacy of authority. So we have research support. Now students sometimes get confused over this evaluation point. So it does support both of the explanations and I'll show you how. So Blash and Schmidt in 2000 showed a film of Milgram's study to students and asked them to identify who they felt was responsible to the harm to the learner. So that is, uh, so the teacher, they're the real participant, the learner's a confederate, and they've also got that experimenter in the room with the teacher, and he is also a confederate. Now what the students do is blame the experimenter. And so the participant, that's our teacher, was merely an agent for the experimenter. So that teacher is just acting for the experimenter, and that's explained in the observed severe distress the participants experience. So we can see that the real participant, the teacher, experiences a lot of distress and that's also involved in the agentic state explanation. So that's how it supports agentic state and the students also indicated that the responsibility was due to legitimate authority. So the idea that the experimenter is at the top of the hierarchy and because they're an intelligent scientist they therefore have that legitimate authority. 
it's a justified authority. Therefore, we can say that both agentic state and legitimacy of authority have been recognised as possible causes of obedience from participants in Milgram's experiment. A limitation of the agentic state explanation is that it is a limited explanation. So the agentic state doesn't explain why some participants didn't obey in the Milgram study. And also it doesn't explain the findings of Hofflin et al. because they showed no anxiety, they just did it. So what I mean by that is that the 21 out of 22 nurses that did obey in terms of they gave the drug to patients because they were ordered to by doctors, what the agentic state explanation predicts is that as the nurses hand over the responsibility to the doctor, they should have shown similar anxiety to that of Milgram's participants as they understood their role in a destructive process, but that didn't happen. So therefore we can say that agentic state only accounts for some situations of obedience, not all. Now we're going back over to the AO1. So this is legitimacy of authority. This is your other explanation on this spread. So this is where we say that in society, certain people in certain positions hold authority over the rest of us. So for example, parents, teachers and police officers do this and their authority is legitimate in the sense that it is agreed by society. So most of us accept this and allow them to exercise power over us. And what legitimate authority allows is power. It gives power to certain members of society. Now, most of us accept that the police has the power to punish wrongdoers and we're willing to give up some of our independence. And what we do is we learn this sort of authority from a young age, in childhood, from teachers and parents. But if that power that is given to people isn't used appropriately, it leads to something called destructive authority. And in this instance, we can use my lay as well. So destructive authority, legitimate authority can be destructive. And we have examples of this in historical leaders. So the examples are Hitler, Pol Pot and Stalin. What they did was order people to behave in ways that are cruel and dangerous. And I'm sure you know much about those already, so you can use those examples. And when we think of Milgram study, the example we have of destructive authority was when the experimenter gave prods to the participants because it meant that participants behaved in ways that went against their conscience. The example of Mei Li is the American soldiers, they killed 504 unarmed civilians. I mean, you can search this on YouTube and Google and find out much more about it, but you just need to know the basics. And the soldiers, they just blew up buildings and the soldiers' defence for them doing that was that they were just doing their duty and following orders. So we do have a strength of legitimacy of authority, and that is that there are cultural differences. So it can explain why there are cultural differences. So it's useful for that. And what we find is that Kilman and Mann in 1974 replicated Milgram study, finding only 16% of their participants went to the full 450 volts. Mantel in 1971 found a different figure for German participants, and that was 85%. And so in some cultures, authority is more likely to be accepted as legitimate and entitled to demand obedience from individuals. And that's why we see differing levels. And what this shows us is that children are raised to perceive authority figures in different cultures differently. And these are supportive findings because it increases the validity of the legitimacy of authority explanation. So another limitation is the obedience alibi. And this relates to the agentic state explanation. And what we say here is that the Nazis behaviour cannot be explained in terms of authority and an agentic shift. So we've got an example here of Mandel in 1998, and this relates to the German Reserve Battalion 101. So men obeyed orders to shoot civilians in a town in Poland. And then they did this, even though they didn't have any direct orders to do so, so that really they were acting out of hatred and greed because they could have been assigned to other duties which didn't involve that. So there was no agentic shift as they did not see themselves as acting as the agents of higher authority. They were given a choice and autonomously acted out of that hatred. 
and this behaviour is different to Milgram's findings where their behaviour was a result of destructive authority. OK, we do have a strength, and um, that's real life crimes. We can apply this to real life crimes, uh, strength relating to legitimacy of authority, and it can help explain how obedience can lead to real life war crimes. So it almost educates us in the sense that it helps us to understand how abusing authority in the sense of making it destructive, using it powerfully, can result in things like the Miley massacre because of the powerful hierarchy of the US Army. So therefore it has practical applications. The legitimacy of authority could be used to challenge it rather than simply obeying mindlessly authority. We can use that to challenge destructive authority. OK, so I've had a little look through the questions, the exam papers that are available to you. So A-level paper one, specimen second set. This came up, outlined two explanations for obedience. I have mentioned this in my dispositional explanations, the authoritarian video, because what this does is it can relate to that spread as well as to this. You could use the two that we have just explained here. Look, remember six marks. It says outline. That means describe it just wants your a01 marks you do not need to be giving evaluation on that particular question and there's your mark scheme for that so make sure you're looking at what it's saying possible explanations there you are so we know three different ones so you could talk about agentic state and legitimacy of authority like i focused on this video or you could talk about authoritarian personality and legitimacy or authoritarian personality and agentic And here, this is what tricks a lot of students. Straight after that first question, this second question comes along and it says briefly evaluate one of the explanations that you've outlined in your answer to question one. So make sure you have chosen an explanation that you know an evaluation point for, or that you can briefly name a few evaluation points. Can be one, as long as you're doing it detailed, but a lot of students tend to go for just a few short ones just so that they can get the three marks. But what the paper can sometimes do is trick students by having the first question on a full page. You turn over and you see that. So what's important is that you're flicking through the exam paper, just turning the next page uh, in that topic to make sure nothing follows on. Because if it does, you want to make sure you've chosen something that you know you can evaluate. Otherwise, you'll waste time by having to go back, scribbling it out, rewriting that and then answering that and ultimately you don't have that long so you don't want to be making that sort of mistake and there's your mark scheme for that making sure it's relating to the explanations presented in question one it's all AO3 for three marks another one that I have seen is this June 2018 A level paper one Outline what is meant by agentic state as an explanation for obedience. This is why it is really important that you know your definitions, because a lot of students will slip up here because they just won't know them. Or they'll, they'll sort of have an idea. People will have an idea, but it won't be in the way that the mark scheme is hinting towards. That is a described question. Here it is, two marks for a clear and coherent outline. So it needs to be clear. You need to be definite in what you're saying. It shouldn't be, oh, not sure, because if you come across as not sure, it'll be clear to the examiner you're not sure about the term. So here it gives a possible answer. So you need to look at what is there. Another thing that I quite like about these mark schemes, it gives you little hints at the bottom. So points above may be presented in the context of an example slash study. You can get a mark out of that if you give an example. With all definitions, if you get entirely stuck and are like, oh gosh, I cannot think at all, but you can think of a study that relates to that definition, use it, write that down. It's more than likely that you would get one mark for that as long as it does relate. Okay, thank you for listening and good luck with the rest of your revision.